Remember when Donald Trump revealed in 2019 that his administration wanted to buy Greenland from Denmark? He was roundly mocked for it in the media at the time, partly because the media didn't need much excuse to mock him, but also because the idea itself seemed so preposterous. The last time one country purchased territory from another was all the way back in 1958, when Pakistan paid Oman $3 million, equivalent to $35 million in today's money, for the port of Guadal, the same seaport that is now a linchpin of the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor and China's Belt and Road Initiative. There are only two examples in history of transactions of land similar in size to Greenland, and both involved the United States as the buyer. The first was of course the Louisiana Purchase of 1803, for which the US paid $15 million, the equivalent of $395 million today, to Napoleon's French First Republic for the rights to 2.14 million kilometers squared, or 828,000 square miles of territory west of the Mississippi River. The second was the Alaska Purchase of 1867, which saw the US pay $7.2 million, equivalent to 145 million today, to the Russian Empire for 1.52 million kilometers squared, or 586,412 square miles. By comparison, Greenland is 2.166 million kilometers squared, or 836,330 square miles, giving it a 26,000 square kilometer edge over the Louisiana Purchase, equivalent to an extra Rwanda. Both the Louisiana and Alaska Purchases gave the United States access to tremendous natural resources, which aided it in developing into the world's greatest superpower. The Louisiana Purchase gave the young nation huge forests, endless lands for grazing and farming, and deposits rich in gold, silver, and other metals. Alaska was at first thought to be worthless, but all that changed with the Nome Gold Rush in 1899 and subsequent discoveries of other substantial mineral deposits, along with oil, gas and fishing resources over the following century. Greenland has a wealth of mineral deposits, the vast majority of which have never been mined. These include gold, silver, iron ore, copper, lead, nickel, zinc, graphite, cobalt, molybdenum, titanium and uranium. But the most significant of all, both in terms of the size of the deposits and its potential future geopolitical ramifications, is rare earths. Rare earth elements consist of lanthanides, the 15 metallic elements numbering 57 to 71 on the periodic table, as well as the chemically similar elements scandium and yttrium, which appear at 21 and 39 respectively. All but one of these 17 elements, promethium, appear on the US government's official registry of critical minerals. These being minerals that are both strategically important to the United States and at risk of supply disruption. The unique properties of rare earths mean they are used in a wide variety of applications, such as alloys, catalysts, batteries, and permanent magnets. Indeed, it is the magnetic properties of some of these rare earths, neodymium, praseodymium, and dysprosium among them, that make them a critical component in applications such as wind turbines, electric vehicles, smartphones, MRI machines, and robots. But the most crucial from the point of view of the United States is defense applications, which currently account for about 5% of US consumption of rare earth elements. Lockheed Martin's F-35 stealth fighter, which is used by the US Air Force and many American allies, uses 920 pounds of rare earths per plane in its electronic warfare systems, targeting radars, and the electric motors that move the plane's rudders. Rare earths are also used in night vision goggles for soldiers, communications equipment, and the propulsion systems of nuclear-powered submarines. While these elements aren't nearly as rare as their name suggests, there are only a handful of locations on Earth where they appear in high enough concentrations to be mined economically. China accounted for 60% of the 280,000 metric tons of rare earth oxide produced in 2021, most of it from the massive Bayan Obo mine in Inner Mongolia and from Mount Yuping and nearby deposits in Sichuan. There are only three notable mines outside of China. MP Materials Corp's Mountain Pass Mine in California, supplying 15% of global production. Linus Rare Earths Mount Weld Mine in Western Australia, supplying 8% of global production and in Myanmar's Kachin Special Region, where numerous local companies allegedly acting as fronts for Chinese investors, according to a Global Witness investigative report, produce 9% of all the world's rare earths. Minor producers include, in order of tonnage, Thailand, Madagascar, India, Russia, Brazil, Vietnam, and Burundi. Although the US is the second largest producer of raw rare earth materials, 
It currently has no processing capacity, which means that all ore mined in California is sent straight to China, where it is separated into oxides that are then converted into metal and used to manufacture magnets and other products. This in effect makes the US a supplier to China's rare earth industry, which exports the final product back to the US and other countries at a substantial markup. There are only two commercial scale rare earth processing facilities outside of China. One is operated by Australia's Linus in Malaysia, and the other by Canada's Neo Performance Materials in Estonia. In 2010, China halted rare earth exports to Japan after the Japanese Navy arrested a Chinese fishing boat captain near disputed islands in the East China Sea. The cost of rare earths skyrocketed following the confrontation, as the American Baker Institute for Public Policy noted in a recent white paper. While China has never restricted supply of rare earths to the United States, the two aren't currently in a state of military hostilities, after all. Rising tensions between the two powers over Taiwan and a host of other issues have woken US officials to the possibility of China doing so. The US has begun to take action. Recent amendments to the National Defense Authorization Act that was signed into law by President Biden require most Pentagon systems to use rare earths mined and refined outside China within five years. And they dictate that the federal government give preference to US suppliers of these materials in government acquisitions. Plans have begun for facilities on US soil. In 2022, the US Department of Defense awarded Linus Corp a contract for construction of a commercial heavy and light rare earth separation facility on the Gulf Coast of Texas, in which the government will share in the funding. Commencement is targeted for 2025. But building up processing capacity only deals with one part of the puzzle. The other part is upstream in mining. And given that you can only mine something in the place where nature intended it to be, this is why Greenland could play a critical role in what some are calling a second Cold War, one with the United States on one side and the People's Republic of China on the other. Several Chinese government-linked firms, among them Shanghai Resources Holding, China Non-Ferrous Metal Industries Foreign Engineering and Construction Company, and China National Nuclear Corporation, have interests in Greenlandic mining projects, and this has become of increasing concern to the US. The US has arrived late to the party, and it may have to rely on companies from its close allies the United Kingdom, Canada and Australia, which hold a combined 27 of the 41 mining licenses listed in Greenland as of 2021 to help protect its interests. Two deposits in southwestern Greenland are of particular interest to the United States, given that they are actually the two largest known rare earth deposits on earth after Bayan Obo. The Kvarnaf Yeld deposit is owned by publicly listed Australian firm Energy Transition Materials, formerly known as Greenland Minerals, although it's worth noting that Cheng He Resources owns a 9% stake in that company and acts as its strategic partner. And the nearby Kringloan deposit is owned by privately held Australian firm Tanbury's Mining Greenland. Mining projects as large as these two are expensive to develop, with a 2019 report estimating that Kvarnaf Yeld will need $505 million in spending to get off the ground, and that figure is presumably a lot higher today due to inflation. But the biggest problem with mining of rare earth elements is that they are often accompanied by radioactive uranium and thorium byproduct, which raises the thorny issue of how and where to store all that toxic waste. Radioactivity was enough of a concern for China to shut down rare earth mines in Jiangxi province and to replace the supply with mining of rich mineral deposits in Myanmar, where it could get away with less environmentally friendly practices according to that investigative report that we referred to earlier. Greenland, which it should be said, is a sovereign part of Denmark that retains control of most of its own affairs, but cedes control of defense and foreign policy to Copenhagen, has walked a tightrope on the issue of rare earths mining for years. On the one hand, it has shown a desire to attract mining companies to its shores, as seen in its hosting of an annual Greenland Day at various mining conferences, and in its membership in an EU initiative to develop rare earth and magnet value chains. On the other hand, there has been popular opposition, to the extent where something can be defined as popular among a population of fewer than 60,000 people, to mining of uranium-bearing deposits. And frankly, it's easy to understand why. When you have one of the world's last truly pristine environments, you want to do everything you can to protect it. In a real act of direct democracy, this debate essentially determined the outcome of the 2021 Greenlandic elections, handling Inuit Atta Katigit, which had pledged its opposition to Kvarnafjeld and uranium mining, victory over the incumbent Siomut party, which had backed Kvarnafjeld for its potential economic benefits. Soon after the election, the Greenlandic parliament passed a law banning preliminary investigation, exploration and mining of any mineral deposit with more than 100 parts per million of uranium. The law also gave it the right to introduce new rules prohibiting mining of radioactive elements other than uranium. This amounted to a complete rejection of the Kvarnafjeld project, 
which contains around 266 parts per million across the three deposits, but not necessarily of Tanbris, which has zirconium, niobium, and tantalum byproduct, but no significant traces of uranium. Energy Transition Materials has begun arbitration proceedings with the governments of Greenland and Denmark, the results of which we will find out in due course. Returning to the bigger geopolitical picture, it's unlikely Denmark will ever agree to sell Greenland to the US, especially given Danish Prime Minister Mette Frederiksen's statement that, quote, Greenland is not Danish, Greenland is Greenlandic. Even if there were a price high enough to convince the Danish and Greenlandic governments of the value of having Nuke become subordinate to Washington rather than to Copenhagen, it would not, to use a Trump-like expression, be the deal of the century from America's perspective. Days of paying mere pennies for a territory so large are long gone. Greenland's mineral riches could command at least a $1.1 trillion price tag, according to an estimate from the Financial Times, and that's without taking into consideration potential riches hiding under the two to three kilometer thick ice sheet that covers 80% of the country. With that said, the US may not have to acquire Greenland in order to secure its rare earth supply chains. Scientists have made progress in research into new materials for locking away radioactive waste, and Finland recently announced plans to construct the world's first permanent disposal site for spent uranium fuel rods from nuclear power plants. Developments that could see Greenlanders one day change their minds about mining. Moreover, Denmark, which retains control over Greenland's security affairs and the European Union, of which Denmark is a member but Greenland is not, share American concerns over China's stranglehold on rare earths and other critical metals. Denmark was one of the 12 founding members of the NATO alliance alongside the United States. Its Air Force has six F-35A jets and another 21 scheduled for delivery, and it is one of eight US allies that have agreed to share in the development costs of future versions of the F-35. So, needless to say, Denmark has a vested interest in ensuring the US can source rare earths. It remains to be seen whether the people of Greenland will ever see things the same way. I'm your host, Nadav, for Mining the World. Thank you as always for watching. If you enjoyed this video and would like to learn more about the geopolitics of mining and other connections between the business of mining and our modern world, please like, comment, share and subscribe. Thank you.